player whose life in earth and pot, in the hands of a great quarter, play returns to play. Arise in the land of the living, the Ibubi, Balabantu production. Yakubi Banabantu, Mutoto wa Kibantu, Bana Vermuntu. Bana Vermuntu. Kembo, kembo, tata na nzambi, mpungu tulendo ya mazulu, so nini na nini somandla, gai, morungu, mwene nyaga, depending on where you are, I greet you. Nusiemi betuabu mbote banaba yesolele, molweni abantwana abango, saubona abantwana babawo weto oswe mazului. Mori ega shiana shiangai na kenda moyo mpo salama watoto wa Mungu yes it's that time we sit and rightly divide the word of truth we continue to break down the bantu kingipiti connection vis-a-vis -vis akanaten and the royals in what was known as Egypt. The truth has never needed defending. It will always defend itself. So I urge you, do your research. Do not take everything I say to be the truth, but I guarantee you, you will arrive to a similar conclusions. Die. Anaveto, we left it at a point where we had seen the correlation between Akhenaten, Joseph. Now we are going to look at uh, this character called King Menes. He was one of the regents in King Gipiti. And in around 3100 BC, King Menes moved north from the south of Egypt. We all know what is south of Egypt probably from an area that is today East Africa mm -hmm. and conquered the Delta. Before this conquest, Gibiti was not a single state, but two independent nations known as Upper and Lower Egypt. The hieroglyph that identifies this as a mad fish signifying that he was the great fish conqueror of all of King Gibiti. That is what they tell us was reconstructed, but it's not possible to ascertain what they have tampered with or what they have not tampered with. But guided by the spirit of our ancestors for the Kembo of Tatan and Zambi by his Ngolo, we arrive to the truth. Signifying that he was a great fish conqueror of all of King Gipiti. From henceforth, the rulers of King Gipiti carried the title of Nsuibiti, which has been trans transliterated by Egyptologists to mean the lord of two lands. But uh, 
tend to have a different point of view for reasons best known to me. It is likely that the great fish that the first Egyptian word in Sui. which will be explained consequently, Vanaveto, comes from Modamaki. Modamaki means a Kikuyu leader. That is why among my people, they call me Modamaki. This noun Modamaki is a compound word and the prefix mu, as in muntu, denotes something with a spirit like a mundu and a mote, a tree, person and tree respectively. The term Modamaki, was reserved for leaders of sections of the Agikoyo or leaders of war councils. The word is intriguing because it's no doubt has the same roots as the Arabic word Samak, which was borrowed by Swahili as Samaki, meaning fish. The Kyaik Swahili word for fish was Niswi. Today, the Kukuyu call the fish tamaki, a word that has been borrowed from Swahili, though the Kukuyu call the fish kiongoyo, the wiggler. It would appear that at some time in the past, they did know fish by the Arabic term, if indeed a leader was associated with fish. Stick with me. Because I'll get to explain where with this, because some of you are already thinking they gone, the fish god, uh, but that is not where we are headed. Because you'll find that they have no originality. All their mythology was uh, is a plagiarized version of our antiquity. You decide. As we have seen, the pharaoh went by the term Nsuipiti. Now let us look at the word Nsui, that's N-S-W, that is spelled in consonants only following the tradition of Hiryog, whatever that name is. It's a Mundele name, but I know it's the writings of those in King Ibiti and the walls. The word Sui, <laughs> forgive me my kings and queens. The word Sui, when written with vowels, become Nisui, which was the archaic Kiswahili word for fish. Now only used in poetry, in the Kiamu dialect. This is attestable by Swahili scholars. One of note is uh, Sheikh Nabi, who has written many books in the Kiamu dialect, the Swahili, dropped the word Nisui and adopted Samaki from Arabic. Today, the Kikuyu no longer called fish Kiongoyo, though you might hear. In uh, selected places and selected villages, you'll still hear that name used because when they talk of Jonah, Jonah are Meridioni Kiongoyo, which would have been a fish and a general term for a fish. Lie. They have also adopted the Arabic term samak, which they render as tamaki due to the lack of the phenom S in the Kikuyu phonology. It would appear that the fish meaning was lost in antiquity, but the word was retained to mean the great fish leader. Later with the coming of colonialism and free trade, the original meaning was regained. In the esoteric book, Exodus 17, 15, Guy is referred to as, quote unquote, Jehovah Nisi. There is every reason to believe that the Nisi in Exodus is the Sui of the Pharaoh Menes. Have this, that in the Pharaoh Menes, the Sui in the Pharaoh Menes have the same root. And 
possibly meaning. Ngai is referred to as, I hate pronouncing that name, but for the purpose of education, by his Ngolo for his Kembo. Jehovah Nisi, there is every reason to believe that the Nisi in Exodus and then Sui of the Pharaoh have the same roots and meaning. Ngai being greater than all other rulers, that is the great fish, and that is why he's called Modamaki wa Adamaki, where you would get the term king of kings coined. Guy being greater than all the alt rulers is the great fish. And this is, the, is in defiance of the concept of pharaohs as good gods as they were known in Kingipiti. They are really gods on earth. If you, if you understood why they were able to become to gods, they travel to the south, Tanateru, to the mountain. That's why they have the pyramids because they wanted to replicate the mountain. Because we understand the mountain is a receiver for the solar radiation. And this solar radiation is transmitted to the melanated ones. But what do I mean? So any firm believer in the true creator, the Ngai or the Mogai, would rather transfer those honors as the Habiru did. You see, they would, because when, when in King Gipiti, they referred to their rulers as gods. But when we arrived in King Gipiti, because of their tongue, we would not ascribe the honors of the creator to their human rulers, the pharaohs. Because this is the thing about Abantwana, Abangoni. No matter how many circles you'll take them, they will always try to associate their creator with the understanding of what they have, cognitive dissonance. And that's how it comes to play, centuries in the making. The term Nisui was more likely an export commodity from King Gipiti to the Negev, to the West, and to all that, ascribing the one who wanted to be like the Most High, who put in his name there and taking the title of the great ruler who the Bantu would not ascribe to an earthly pharaoh because they understood there was only one Somandla, and that is the creator, Ngai Morungu, Mwene Nyaga, so Nini Nanini Somandla, our Tata Utata Weto Oswe Mazuluini Utata wa Bakoko Beto Gai Wama the Maito, the mighty one of our fathers. Lai. So the, 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 in the consonant, Nusi. Nisui and Mudamaki have the same semantic field of a venerated leader, a Somandla, who is associated with fish. And I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men. Fishers of men. As stated earlier, fish is called kyongoyo in the Agikoyo tongue and ikoyo, ikoyo among the Kamba who are cousins from the Agikoyo. We saw that in the first installation of this series. So Amundele writing in 1919 marked 
remark that the root of the word kikuyu seems to have come from fish, though one of their own still corrected that it came from mokoyo, a fig tree, the big sycamore tree. You see now how easy these words get lost in translation because you, if you do not follow the etymology of that word throughout history, what it was used. You see like um, you will find among the Hopi people, the word for sun is the word for moon among the Tibetan people because they live on the opposite side, but they spoke one tongue and tried to associate the same thing with one tongue. And if you think the Hopi people are distinct from the Bantu, rethink. In the 18th dynasty, there was a story that Sanehat, we had seen him in the, sorry, I need to, just bring up my notes. Yes, in the 18th dynasty, dynasty, sorry, we noticed that the story of Sanehat, son of the sycamore, allusion, allusion allegory to the tree again. Apparently, after a change in leadership, I have said, Itweka, Sanehat had gone into exile, fearing assassination. While in exile, he became homesick, even though he had done well for himself and become wealthy. Get this? Masa. <laughs> Was the king of Kush. From our understanding, and you see the timeline. And how they try to switch the timeline so that you're lost in sort of a spiral, a rabbit hole, a self-defeating rabbit hole. But without the knowledge and the guidance of the ancestors, you cannot connect this. Verily, I say unto you, kings and queens of his soul. From my understanding of uh, the Kikuyu mythology, the founder of the Agikoyo tribe was called Gekoyo, which translates to the great sycamore tree in the article Akenatan and the Akikoyo. It has been theorized that Akenatan, who was Pharaoh, had a strong connection with the Agikoyo. We connected that with Joseph. You see, some of these are extra. Um, I extract this information from their historical books and connect it with the information on the land and the wisdom of the ancestors. And that's why it's able to flow like that. But you will not find any of this particular information in one particular book. We can safely conclude that Saikamo was a pharaonic title for leader. It's a title for a leader. The Meru people who are Kikuyu neighbors to the north encountered people whom they called Ikara, Okara, Adamagi, and Moko in the Mount Kenya area. Adamagi is a word that corresponds to the Kikuyu Adamaki, plural form of Adamaki, and Samaki in Arabic, and Samaki in Swahili was the Mount Kenya area the abode of retiring pharaohs or the, did the Kikuyu arrive earlier than the Meru and settled under the leadership of the descendants of a pharaoh? Ephraim and Manasseh. What do I do the research? Who, like Sanehat, were sons of the Sikamo, Amokoyo? Because if Yosefu's wife was of the order of King Gipiti or the house of King Gipiti, Obviously occurring much earlier than the reign of Menes in 3100 BC because a great ruler was also associated with the sycamore tree. We see here 
a semantic shift where the word sycamo in Kikuyu Mokoyo is also associated with fish, Kiongoyo, enter, they gone. Kiongoyo, Ikoyo in Kamba. This has caused confusion amongst early scholars, some of whom, like Sir Harry Johnston, thought that the Kikuyu derived the name from the word fish. But actually, Modamaki comes from, and my Kikuyu kings and queens help royals in the four corners understand this. Lie. That same guy in Ezekiel, I will all I will also destroy the idols. You're still looking at menes with which Egypt abounded, making an idol of all sorts of creatures, rational and irrational, animate and inanimate, and in which they trusted, whereof this being destroyed, they had nothing to put their confidence in. I will cause their images to seize out of north called Moth, Hosea 9, 6, and which they were rightly, they rightly render Memphis, as many versions do, and was very famous for idolatry. Here stood the temple of Serapis and the temple of other idols. Here Isis and Osiris were worshipped and it was in Jerome's time. As the metropolis of Egyptian superstition. But all this thought, there are two separate areas. There's King Gibbity of Kush and there's Egypt of Babylon. Now what the Mundele did was to try to merge a city. I will, there, there will be a clip at the end of this video. Watch it, then come back here. And it will make sense because breaking it down involves stepping on some toes I'm not ready to step on for now. I will cause their images to seize out of North Cold Moth and which they rightly they right render Memphis as many versions do here, and was very famous for idolatry. Here stood the temple of Serapis and the temple of other idols. Here Isis and Osiris were worshipped, and it was in Jerome's time, as the metropolis of Egyptian. It was built by Menes, the Mitzrayim of the scriptures. Now get this, eh? the Mitzrayim of the scriptures, the first king of King Gipit. But hold that thought. I really want you to pay attention because this is where they threw us off. Though the other killers makes Ukoras to be Ukorias. I, sometimes some of these names you, you, you don't even bother pronouncing because they have no band to basis on them. So pronouncing them just messes up your vocal cords. Some interpreters take this city to be the same, which with that is now called Alakir or Grand Cairo, or however, that this was built upon the same spot or near the same place that was. Remember the, to watch the video at the end of this broadcast, in which I have followed them on Isaiah 19.13 and Jeremiah 2.16, mark those scriptures. Uh, I wish for purposes of time, I will not go into them. Whereas Cairo stands right over against old Memphis, the Nile being between them on the east side of it, and Memphis on the west. Catch that. On the east, and then Memphis in the west, as it's clear from Herodotus and from the charts of Dr. Shaw and Mr. Norden, who observe that some take 
the place of it to have been where a village now stands. Dr. Shaw calls Geza and Mr. Norden Gize, and there shall be no more a prince in the land of King Gibiti. But watch this, Panabeto. Ezekiel 29.3. My river is my own. I have made it myself. Egypt does not exist. That is a concept we have in our minds, which we call Egypt. It describes the reality only to a limited degree. Indeed, Egypt exists, Tingipiti, even less than when we would expect. In that, our concept of the land has been so twisted by the faulty chronology, the time chronology, we imagine that its ancient culture just suddenly coalesced out of the Stone Age, essentially fully formed like wisdom from the brow of a storm god. <laughs> Repetition has made such an, such, such an idea acceptable, cognitive dissonance, fear-based mind conditioning, inception at conception, inception at birth. They have so many systems to keep us in this loop. But if we consider the subtleties, we see how unlikely, how far-fetched such a scenario is. And we are looking at this, Panabeto, because in disseminating the truth, we go deep. The name Egypt is first found in Lina B script at the Minoan stronghold of Knossos on Crete. After the non-existent dark age, we only, we have no proof of this dark age of Greece, supposedly separated by five centuries, the heroic age of the Mycians from the Achaic age of the tyrants of the Ion I Ion Ionians. Egypt is next found in Homer's Odyssey. Now these are books by the Mundele, their literature. Yes, we break it down, we go and take the battle to their lives. The name is thought to derive from Hikupta. Pta, for those in the Kemetic science understand Pta, the mansion of Ka. You remember Superman, Kalel? Ka of Pta. He's known by many titles but the attributes remain the same. Let those with ears hear, let those with understanding understand. The only thing that was objected was idolatry, trying to construct your understanding, trying to create the creator, trying to box as we have always done, trying to box the creator into according to our understanding, because that is what the calcified pineal gland does, tries to do type, put title to that of which has no title. Thy, thy, thy young guy, thy. A name for Memphis, remember Memphis? The West, capital of lower Northern Egypt. The stock of the north and the stock of King Gipiti. Memphis itself was the name of the pyramid of Pepi the first of dynasty six and indicated the city as well. It means established as goodly and is used in the Bible, Hosea 9 6 and Isaiah 9 13 to stand for all of King Gipiti. You see, there's a, there's a clear distinction here. The name, Memphis itself was the name of the pyramid of Pepe of the dynasty. Not even going to bother what dynasty that, and indicated the city as well. It means established as goodly and is used in the Bible. 
Hosea 9, 6, and Isaiah 19, 13, to stand for all of Egypt. One place becomes the entire region. There's a city known for idolatry. And watch this. The Bible implies that Mitzrayim, son of Ham, the Hamites, Nottingham, Southampton, Hamburg, and we are, we are taking it from their books and exposing the lies. Was the first to settle in Egypt. You see, Mizraim, son of Ham. And that's where they tried to throw us. We already know who the Hamites are now. Was the first to settle in Egypt, specifically the northern region of the Delta. Mizraim became the biblical name for King Gipiti. Illusion of inclusion has always been their play. They'll always to try and associate themselves with that of which is not of themselves. Even in describing people of that land who are not descended from Mitzrayim, you see? Mitzrayim is descended from Ham. We already know who the Hamites are, but they are using the, the, the name of the descendant of Ham to describe the entire region even naming descend, uh, uh, including people that are not even descended from Ham. Do you see this? Because we have the Shemites, Abantuana Abangone, we have the Nilots, who are just by the sardine stone, those that dwelt in the tents of Shem. Even in describing people of the land who are not descended from Mitzrayim, but Mitzrayim was not the name which the ancient Egyptians called themselves. Forms of these words have not been found in Egyptian texts, but are found in non biblical texts in the 19th and the 14th century. That is only 200 years after the Hyksos domination. Boom! We know who the Hyksos were. You can call themselves whatever they want. They can rebrand themselves as many times as they want. But we are hot on your trail, Mr. Mundele. Thy guidance from the, our righteous ancestors for the goal, by the goal for the game of Tatan and Zambi, who my people call Gai Morungu Mwene Nyaga. Yes, the one who accepts the living sacrifices of Abantuana Abangone, those without sin, kings and queens scattered to all the four corners. And this message is coming to free you from mental slavery. The name Egyptians themselves used for their country, now those of King Gipiti, Kme, black soil. Kemi, black, is related to the name, or was given relation, or rather to the name Ham. Although we need not assume that Ham or his son Mizraim were dark skinned. Ham was the father of several dark skinned races. His son Kush was the father of the Negro Ethiopians. His son Put of the dark skinned Somalians. You've heard of the Somali Bantus. Now connect the dots. And his descendants through Kenan seems to have been quite dark skinned as we will see in the days of brass and iron. The earliest historic Egyptian population was partly, listen to this, 
Hamitic and partly Semitic. With the Semites apparently, yes, of course, they did intermingle. How else would they have known the existence of these people? How else would they have known the existence of the melanated ones if they did not mingle prior? They started studying these people. They wanted to be like these people because just like their father, the truth can never abide in them for they, are they have been murderers, plotting murder from the very inception. The earliest historic uh, King Ibiti population was partly hermetic and partly Semitic, and the Semites apparently been the dominant language group as we have been. The patriarch Mitzrayim may account counterintuitively for part of the Semitic influence and his sons account for the hermetic population. Now you see the people in that region, there's, there's a blend, sort of black your mentor. And they have a disdain for the melanated ones. Yeah, watch the news, wake up. Talking about far north, close to. The 1884 conference perpetrators. The invasion a few generations later by Nimrod in his conquests would have resulted in a large influx of Mesopotamians of mixed race. We shall consider the matter in depth later. Around the time of Dynasty I, a Babylonian influence had been identified and a synchronism with the Jed, Jed, Jemet Nasir period of Babylonia is established. The culture known as Jebet Nasir may have developed in Elam rather than in Babylonia. But this is a minor point in any case. Cylinder seals from the early Egyptian tombs indicate a connection with Mesopotamian Shemites. Now remember, Abantuana Abangone are not limited by space. They have always traveled. That's why we have people as far as the hope. We were the first ones to travel. If you read the Testament of the Patriots, you will understand that we were the first ones to sail by sea. And we covered that in a spiritual warfare uh, a few months back. I'll try and add the video in the description. But this is a minor point. Uh, the conventional paradigm requires that Jemed Nasir be older than Dynasty One, when in fact it is younger. The era is possible because King Gibiti is unstratified in terms of archaeology. In Egypt, during the immediate post babel period, we find three significant names. Mitzrayim, Menes, and Nama. Now, we know Josephus was a liar and influenced a lot by the Ptolemic period and uh, he was, excuse my French, a Roman kiss us. Josephus informs us that for Menes to, from Menes to Solomon was over 1,300 years. Solomon ended his rule in 1931 and 1,300 years earlier is within shouting distance of the year 2192 when the confusion at Babel occurred. The feat is not perfect, Bernadette but it is only about 40 years off, 40 years. There must have been a hepset. 
which is very close compared to the standard paradigm, which is well over 2000 years old. The name Israel may derive from Matsur, meaning something with hems in. That is a border. Its past may be broken into mm, one who, Sir, to enclose, and Yam, the sea, one that is enclosed by the sea, one that lives in an island. The island of Pleiades, Europe, the West should decide. But there is an island. One who builds dikes and drain morasses. Mm. Zeus Canal. Mitzrayim was the patriarch of the primo Egyptian race and his offspring settled along the Nile in clans establishing what are supposed to have been 42 petty kingdoms, 22 norms in the south and 20 norms in the north. The norms were retained as districts of central authority even by alien kings. And in times of disunity, they acted as independent states. However, we must remember the vast misunderstanding of standard chronology, which creates the illusion that the importance of the norms lasted longer than it really did. Thus, the norms were important in the dynasty, but the dynasty thrived not a thousand years after the start of Egyptian history, but rather only a hundred years, a few hundred years for that matter. Egypt enters upon the stage of secular history with the mention of King Menes. So you see why I'm focusing on these Egyptian kings, especially those whose mummies have, or whose, uh, what do you call them? Statues have had their nose and their lips because they wanted to take away the negroid and the, the negroid nose and the negroid lips. They wanted to cover their tracks. But unfortunately, there's no perfect crime before the eyes of Tatana Nzambe, Yamazulu, Mpungu, Tulendo, Solini, Nanini, Somandla, Ngai Morungu, Mwene Nyaga. The king of Abydos and the Turin canon give the founder of the dynasty, the first dynasty as many, Menes, Maneto says the first dynasty lasted for about 252 years. That is circa 2192 to 1940 BC and was ruled by demigods and heroes. To the ancient mind, these are the same thing. He gives Menes about 60 years as king, which would have started shortly after the confusion at Babel. It is said that the norms were tamed and unified by Menes, and he built Memphis as his capital, although Maneto lists him as ruling in Thinis, this near Girga, some 310 miles south of modern Cairo, Menes fought in the Eastern Desert and elsewhere and according to Maneto, was killed by a horse-shaped river monster. We need not overextend our imagination if we recognize the hippopotamus. The river horse. In this description, more people are killed by hippos than by lions or crocodiles. Now, it is possible even likely that Mitzrayim and Menes are the same person. Just as the Bible gives Mitzrayim as the patriarch of, King, uh, of Egypt, Menes is univers universally affirmed in secular history as the first king of Egypt. Their names seem to describe the same event, just as Mitzrayim and close the sea, Menes means establisher or everlasting, and the thing which is established was, of course, the Nile. Herod Herodotus says that the primal land of Egypt 
proper, which was lower northern Egypt, was flooded up to Thebes. He says, the first man to rule King Gipiti was Min, in whose time the whole country except the district of Thebes was marsh. None of the land below Lake Morris then showed above the water, Goshen. The land was flooded to the foot of the Libyan mountains. Menes diverted the course of the Nile with a strong dike, which was maintained until the days of the Persian pharaohs. Xaxis. And the time of Esther because in the time of Esther, that is when we also see in the deuterocanonical books of the mountain dwellers. The deck directed the waters to the middle of the valley where many spilled the city of Memphis in the bed of the ancient channel, having set the Nile course. Having set the Nile's course. The pharaohs of King Gipiti might well have said Ezekiel 29.3, my river is mine own. I have made it for myself. They won't teach you that in history books. And that is why this book, you need a decalcified pineal gland to, to show you exactly where the deception is because they want to put in, they want to plagiarize and put in their information. You know, they want to associate themselves with the history of our people. Mene's wife is given as Hept, veiled one, whom we have met before and shall meet again shortly, as Isis or Semiramis. I will not attempt to explain how a single woman could be the wife and daughter of Asha and the wife of both brothers Mitzrayim and Kush, and also the wife of Kush's son Nimrod and grandson Gilgamesh, who was her own son. Given the corruption of the woman, none of this seems beyond her. <laughs> Although it may be that the sources are corrupt, that the name was a title or office held by numerous women, or simply that several women had the same name, of which I highly doubt. Be that as it may, we find that another king named Nama is also said to have unified Upper and Lower Egypt, Akhenaten. and to have started Dynasty One and built Memphis as his capital, what are we to make of this? Anama and Men is the same individual, really. Rare, Lord, if craving, carvings on stone pallets give us our picture of this era in King Gipiti, a slate pallet from dynasty, from the first dynasty, about circa 2100 to 3000, found at Hierakop. Conpolis, ancient Neken, the pigs Nama wearing the southern crown of Ad Upper Egypt. The image is framed by two human-faced bulls, which powerfully identifies Nama with Nimrod. A later inscription known as the Nama palette shows him wearing the crown of southern Egypt. And the hieroglyphs are translated as Horus brings the captive to lower Egypt. So it appears that Nama was king of the Southern Kingdom who conquered the North. Kush. We've established the pyramids in Sudan. 
That was the capital of Nimrods. That was the headquarter of Nimrod. The place is still on the map, Sena. Yeah, yeah, Robert Headley covered this. I have covered this on Sena in Sudan. The, 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 the less talked about pyramids in the Sudan. But when, but then of, what then of Menes? We know that Nimrod was the nephew of Mitzrayim. It would appear that Menes was the primo king of Egypt, ruling in Tinis and working to make the valley prosperous for the refugees from Sena, or what they want to say, Shina. Herodotus tells us that Menes drained the morasses and tamed the land. The distinctive culture, artistic and literary, which so characterized Egypt, were developed at this earliest period, lasting perhaps 60 years. Sometime later, he or his successor was overwhelmed by Nema Nimrod, who invade, invaded from Mesopotamia, intent upon his conquest. Nimrod apparently established his base in the south, perhaps settling at Thebes. Biba. Google that name, Viba, T-H-I-B-A. T-H-I-B-A. Eventually he unified the land, adopting Memphis in the north as his new capital building in Memphis. It may be said that he built it. I was not there, so I cannot say definitively, but this is what I can say. The unique character of the land of the Nile dictated its political destiny, just as the terrain of Mesopotamia sealed its fate, specifically the physical nature of Egypt, a land that for 500 miles had length but scarcely any breadth, rendered it difficult to rule. Even under the most favorable conditions, a king who delegated control in the norms to powerful local officials caught a disaster. The act of unifying King Gipiti was no small task and holding it together was a monumental chore beyond the capabilities of many of its kings as demonstrated by the nomarch pharaohs of the various dynasties. But Nimrod did conquer because he knew of the north and of the south. As would be accepted at this early time of unification, upper and southern Egyptian traditions, particularly religious ones, were evidently given greater prominence than those of the north. Apparently, Misraim, the son of Ham and the grandson of Noah, originally instituted a region involving the name of Seth or Seth, a name closely linked to Shem, but a name closely linked to Shem, but also to serpents. The cross and the serpents that I talked about in the first installation. I can't make this stuff up, Anabeto. It's research and guidance from the ancestors. Go seek more of yourself. I stand corrected, but I guarantee you will arrive to the same conclusion. This sect was suppressed by the Kushite cult of Horus which is only to be expected considering the fact that the conquering Nimrod, son of Cush and Horus was so closely linked. So you see, the author of confusion, what he tries to do,
Over half a millennium later, when the Semitic Hyksos invaded Egypt, when you hear of Semitic Hyksos, you know we are talking of anything Ashkenaz. Because the Hyksos, the Hyksos and have no association with the Semitic people, Abantuan Abangone, those of the way of Nsiemi. From all this, we may speculate for the purposes of teaching, for the purposes of understanding that Mitzrayim was an ally uh, give me a minute when I wait to. from all this we may speculate that Mitzrayim was an ally of Shem as opposed to the apostates of Babel who had been led by his brother Cush and his nephew Nimrod on the other hand, Mitzrayim may have worshipped in the same serpentine cult and the supplanting of his paganism by that of Nimrod would just be the exchange of one evil for another. You decide. I continue to ask you, Banabeto. Unguban, who are you? Know thyself. The truth has never needed defending it will always defend itself. So what is he that was, is, and is to come by his Ngolo for his Kembo We continue to disseminate this truth. Until next time to you kings and queens, I say Ngueta. And um, for those in Barbados, there's a, there's a place they are meeting. So get in touch with you in Barbados. There's a group that uh, meets and they wanted to reach out to any of you that might be watching. Die, Dada Yang Dai Dai. Die, Dada Yang Dai Dai. Kirinya Dai Dai 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 Kirinya Dai Dai